everyone to one of our exit seminars. So we have uh, Ming Chiu today talking about his PhD research, uh, which related to uh, measuring the volume of contracting cardiac trabeculae. So Ming completed a BE in mechatronics uh, from Auckland before the ABI poached him uh, to go into physiology research. And so he's done a lot of work with, with bioinstrumentation and living tissue, uh, and he's going to tell us something about that. So along the way, Ming found the time to actually start a company. Um, so he co-founded uh, Spark 64, and now um, he's spending time um, doing some uh, research work uh, with uh, with Andrew and Paul, and also spending time working on the company. So he's going to tell us all about this long and exciting journey. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, <coughs> right, I, I started in electronics, actually, hence the subtitle there. Mechatronics Engineers Journey Through the Realms of Physiology. Um, so I guess I'll kind of go, um, go over what I did for my PhD over the last four years or so, and also kind of how it all started and where I'm at now. Just to kind of introduce myself a little bit, I um, started, I grew up in West Auckland um, at a school called Liston College. I don't know if anyone here has heard of it. It's near Waitakere College. Um, so I went to school there for look, seven years. And then, I guess near, around year 12, I actually still didn't know what I was going to do long term. Um, I think it was until year 13, everybody kept asking me, what are you going to do next year at university? And I decided I should go and figure that out. So um, I think at that point as well, I still thought engineers were just guys with hard hats um, working on bridges. Um, so that, that changed completely when I kind of looked through the, the course guides and went to the Auckland University Open Day. And um, from there on, I, I decided that mechatronics was what I wanted to do because um, it's got a nice kind of mix of um, mechanical and electrical engineering and also a bit of computer science, and it's very hands-on. Um, I was tossing between that and uh, biomedical engineering to start with, but no worries, I ended up in bioengineering in the end anyway. Uh, between, between finishing my bachelor's degree and going into my PhD, I did work a little bit on um, 3D printers, and I attempted attempted to build a quadcopter. I flew this high, <laughs> but couldn't control it well. But um, built a, well, helped the school build their 3D printer as well. It was quite nice to see um, a classroom of high school high school kids being able to build on these things and then use it for their own projects. So that was that was a nice little uh, experience. And then yeah. Started here at the ABI doing my PhD in bioengineering. So, I guess you might wonder with all the other stuff that I've been doing, why did I choose bioengineering? Well, even at high school, after I looked through the course guide, you know, I was tossing up between biomedical engineering and mechatronics. I wanted to do, I liked the you know, software and the electronic side of mechatronics, but I didn't want to apply that in a biological domain. So. I came onto one of the ABI, um, I think it was a postgraduate evenings, and uh, just to kind of get a feel of what it's like. And um, I remember I met, that's where I met Paul Nielsen, who then became my co-supervisor for my PhD. Um, he took he took us, a group of us around up to level five, and I remember being very impressed and and sort of the engineering um, capabilities. Um, Yet it also had a very strong sort of physiology presence as well. I remember being very impressed with the biaxial rig there. Um, so that there stretches um, skin and tries to kind of determine the mechanical properties. Uh, looks very over-engineered, but it's a pretty neat device. So that, that's kind of from there on. I kind of decided, yeah, this this is probably where I want to be. Um, I remember when Paul took us around um, level five. He also uh, showed us the most important uh, piece of machinery, <laughs> well, the coffee machine. <laughs> it actually proved to be a pretty important machine for getting through some of those papers and the thesis. Um, and also picked up some nice uh, coffee making skills. I only ever achieved that, that kind of foam once though, so <laughs> consistent. But hey, if I, if I ever get sick of engineering, I can go work in a cafe, I suppose. <laughs> Um, so after, after I guess that, I decided to kind of have a look at the projects that were on offer at ABI. And that's when I came across this cardiac myometer project led by Andrew 
who is my main supervisor uh, for my PhD project. And so this was one very ambitious project where um, the group wanted to create an instrument which, uh, where you can mount a piece of heart muscle tissue, stimulate it, and then measure a lot of different parameters, as you can see there, sarcomere length, um, calcium concentration, force length. And this was a, I guess this um, project I felt suited me because I had uh, the kind of mechatronics training um, for my um, bachelor's degree. I still wanted to work in kind of software, hardware, and the electronics as well, but bring it to the biological domain. So this was kind of a perfect project. And at the time, um, Alex Anderson and also uh, Count Johnston, uh, two other PhD project, uh, uh, two other PhD um, candidates at the time were working on it. So, um, yeah, I mean, now it looks like this. It has become a reality. And um, yeah, I'll basically for the rest of this, I'm gonna talk a bit more about my contributions in this instrument. Of course, I don't single-handedly build all of this. Um, but yeah, I'll go through kind of what I did build. Just to kind of give you an um, introduction of how this <coughs> instrument works, uh, for those of you kind of new to this, basically uh, what we can do is take a piece of heart muscle uh, from the heart, from the ventricles of the heart. Something that we use is uh, called cardiac trabecular, which are these rod-like um, bundles of muscle that's found in the ventricles. So that can be dissected and placed inside, um, probably, let me see, inside the center of that gold mounting chamber. Um, and let me just zoom in there. We put a muscle in there and you can apply, first of all, you keep it alive with some um, solution uh, that mimics kind of, um, that provides it with nutrients and then you can stimulate it of an electrical pulse to cause it to contract. Didn't really loop there, but you can see that little uh, bottom left corner. That's a, that's a piece of trabecular contracting. Now, while it's contracting, you can measure a whole bunch of parameters, such as how much force it's producing, how much, what the heat expenditure is, um, sarcomere length, and a whole bunch of other things. So, <coughs> Why do you want to do these experiments? Well, the whole goal of this is to, I guess, help us understand heart muscle a little better. And why do we want to do that? Well, if you, let, let's take a car, for example. You know, you know that a car takes you from A to B quicker than probably walking. Um, and that's all good until, you know, something goes wrong. And if something goes wrong, what do you do then? Um, and you can really only diagnose it and, you know, maybe fix it as well, if you kind of knew what the internal kind of workings of the car is, whether it's a, whether it's a battery problem or whatever. So that's, that's kind of the aim here, is to kind of tease out those components of heart muscle tissue. And not just that, not just being able to then, you know, create treatments around it, but also understanding how the environment that heart muscle is, uh, is exposed to, um, sorry, the environment affects it. So for example, whether it's um, disease or um, the, the person is, is, is on some particular diet. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we kind of know that, you know, like a petrol engine, a diet of diesel doesn't turn out very well most of the time. So, you know, being able to understand, be able to create those environments and understand um, what happens to heart muscle. Cool. So, the, you can perform these experiments at different scales. You can go um, the whole heart. Um, so this is um, the whole heart extracted um, from a rat in a, in a Langendorf um, perfusion setup. So um, that's kind of at a um, larger scale in, vi uh, in vitro. You can do. Then you can go um, one further down, which is taking a bundle of um, cardiomyocytes in this case, trabecular, so you're looking at kind of the one millimeter scale there, which is what we do. And then you can go even further down into a single um, cardiomyocyte, which is a muscle cell. And I guess there are advantages and disadvantages of working at different levels here. Um, of course, with the whole heart, uh, you've got a lot of other components that make up the heart. So when you're performing experiments, 
um, you do um, you do have you know the effects of a lot of other parts, I suppose. And um, if you want to remove, I guess peel some of that off, um, go right into I guess just the muscle itself. Let's say all the way down to a muscle cell. Um, that will give you you know um, that will allow you to perform experiments that just affect the cardiomyocytes. But then there are also issues. Um, it's very small, so it's a little harder to handle. Um, so, you know, we can go in between, which is trabecular, where we can, it's big enough for us to measure the heat, um, but it's also small enough for us to be able to, um, um, uh, to be able to, let's see, superfuse in solution and still have enough oxygen right, uh, reach right into the middle of the muscle. Cool. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're um, predominantly using uh, my, well, rats um, because of the kind of short gestation period and um, you can kind of genetically modify them to exhibit, exhibit some um, diseases. Cool, so I guess getting a bit into what, I, what my PhD was all about. So, I mean, these experiments have been going on for a long time. I guess where I come in is solving, well the first problem I'm solving is being able to normalize the data that you collect from the muscle. So some of the, the data that you measure does depend on the size um, of the muscle, the volume of the muscle. Um, for example, if you want to normalize heat um, or if you want to find stress. Now traditionally what's done is that you look under a microscope and you take several WIPs uh, measurements across um, the length of the muscle. You, just, you can assume that it's a cylinder and from there work out what the approximate volume is. But I guess the, the main problem there is that if you look at this, um, I don't think you'd be able to tell me you know, is, whether or not it's a cylinder, whether or not it's a ribbon-shaped muscle that's been twisted, um, or whether the shape changes right along the, the muscle. <coughs> so you could probably do one better by putting, up a, putting a, a mirror somewhere to get a 90 degree orthogonal view of the other side, um, I guess of the orthogonal direction. But still, you still have some issues um, of not being able to figure out what the exact shape is. So that's, that's kind of first problem solving. And um, uh, So Young Gu did, some, did a study um, imaging, imaging trabecular using, um, <coughs> using confocal microscopy. And uh, you can see that the cross sections of trabecular does vary quite a lot. And um, in some cases, I'll show you later, it varies along the muscle as well. And also it depends on how you mount the muscle. So if you mounted it in, for example, sort of uh, on a non-ideal angle, then you can severely overestimate the volume. Another thing is that you know, if it's not actually uniform, then we don't actually know, and we, if we don't know the shape, we can't actually predict whether or not um, um, there's uniform strain across the muscle when it contracts. And again, looking at, uh, from a microscope by eye, um, sometimes you can see the big features of the muscle moving around, sometimes you can't, so that's another issue that we'll be addressing. And finally, you can get 3D measurements of this muscle. You can get a 3D image of this muscle if you take it out of the um, machine, um, out of the rig, from the imaging, and put it back in, for example, or doing it at the start. But of course, you want to minimize the amount of handling that you have to do with the muscle because they're they're really delicate. Um, I think the, the diameter is on the order of 150 microns. Um, Without the careful handling skill of, say, JC, who's been doing this for years, you'd easily damage the muscle. <laughs> <laughs> so, summarizing, that's, uh, that's, uh, those are the problems that I'll be solving, and I guess I'll just be going into a little bit more detail for each one, for each part. So, first bit is normalizing this data. Um, and the approach I've taken was to use optical coherence tomography, which is an optical technique for, for uh, measure, doing subsurface imaging. And 
Um, doing this, doing subsurface imaging on a uh, specimen is nice because uh, you are able to imagine entire muscle um, without even having to rotate it. Um, how it works is that you send it a, um, you, you have a light source that penetrates through the sample. And because there's imperfections in the samples, there's you know, structural features in the sample, you get um, reflections. And these reflections are collected um, back, into, back into the system. And if you're able to determine sort of the depth at which these reflections came from um, and intensity of these reflections, then you can build up a um, 2D cross-sectional profile. And if you scan um, the if you scan the light source across in another direction, you can build up a 3D volume scan. Um, so, how this works? You couldn't, you know, it's it is light, so you can't. Time of flight is a little difficult to do. Um, how how um, it's usually done is through um, well. How it's done is through interference. Um, it operates on a principle called low coherence um, tomography. And the idea is that um, if you have a, a light source with a low coherence length, it can only interfere um, when the path lengths of two signals are very, very close together, in this case, around the order of a couple of microns. So um, in the most simplistic form of OCT, you have a reference beam. You have your 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 beam that's um, I guess penetrating the the sample, and you basically um, scan your reference mirror at different depths, and only only light coming from a depth that matches the the path length of your reference um, reference source will interfere and just give you a signal. And if you move that around, scan along the sample, you can kind of build up a intensity profile. <coughs> Um, so that's kind of the, I guess, the, the, the physics behind it. Um, so I was fortunate uh, enough to work with um, Norman from the physics department, um, who, who was a PhD student at the time, and he helped kind of assemble um, a lot of the optics to put together this OCT system that we're using for the Um I guess what I did for, um, was to integrate this OCT into the system. Um, so that we're able to perform OCT imaging while the sample is inside, um, inside the muscle buff, and or even while it's contracting. So here's a kind of a, a kind of diagram showing you how the, the interfaces that this um, beam of light travels through. So it goes through air, um, glass, more air, glass, and then the solution. The nice thing is that although it does. Um, Although it does change kind of the optical path length, um, these different mediums, um, that's kind of easily correctable, and we are still able to get a full image of the muscle while it's inside the muscle bar, while it's being fed with solution. And um, I guess a, a lot of initial work when I was integrating the OCT into the myometer was around the electronics. Um, I guess. At first, the software that drove this device was um, completely on um, LabVIEW. So I wanted to be able to get hardware processing, um, uh, yes, and deterministic processing um, using an FPGA. So I've kind of I split out some of the processing that was happening up in LabVIEW on the desktop PC into an FPGA. And that includes um, doing the fast Fourier transform and um, doing the linearization. And that significantly improved the speed of the device, so about 10 times more than what it was um, in software. And another advantage is, which I'll kind of show you later on why this is a big advantage, is the hardware synchronization. Um, although both the galvanometer, uh, galvanometer here, which steers the beam around the sample, and the camera, line scan camera, which captures the signal, are both connected still to a PC. Um, the FPGA is synchronized with the data acquisition card and hardware, which which triggers and, and drives the galvanometer. Um, nice thing is that uh, because everything is kind of at hardware level, it's completely synchronized. Um, you won't have a situation where, um, let's see, 
during one one set of scans, you're taking a thousand images. This is now second, a set of scans, you're taking a thousand one, which is not desirable for reconstruction, as I'll show you later on. And we're now able to trigger again over a hardware interface. Um, trigger the acquisition based on um, the stimulus that we provide the muscle. And that, this will be useful later when we're doing gated OCT. Oh, okay, I guess it's just illustrating. I was pretty proud of that, so I drew a box around the FPG. <laughs> I spent a lot of time on that part. <laughs> cool, so I showed you this earlier, the, the muscle, and I guess now here's the spoilers of what it actually looks like. So this particular muscle, I um, captured the volume I'm using OCT, and just rotating around it, you can see that it's actually, um, it's got an elliptical cross section, but it's been twisted. And this you wouldn't have been able to see if you're just looking at the 2D image by itself. So, um, with the raw signal, there is a bit of noise, as with a lot of acquisition processes. So, um, I developed or uh, implemented a, a image processing pipeline, which would get rid of all of this noise and segment the muscle volume out of the image, which is um, useful. So, so some of the noise you get is speckle noise. Um, that's just inherent to the physics of OCT um, systems. Here's a glass from the capillary and um, other small particle reflections. If there's a piece of dust, you get intense reflections um, in your image. And here's, of course, your signal of interest. So with um, these reflections, you can remove them relatively well, well enough for segmentation with a stripe filter. With speckle noise, um, because they're, they're random, um, the, the best way to, to avoid it is, well, the best way to reduce it is to take multiple um, scans of the same um, same area and then average them out, which is what we would have done here. And you know, one of them. I haven't shown the entire pipeline in this slide. And will the glass just crop it out? It's far away enough. So this is what you kind of end up with. And. Yeah, it works, works relatively well there. Um, and what this um, segmentation gives us is the ability to pull the cross-sectional area over the length of the muscle at different muscle lengths, as an example. Um, and you can then integrate um, this to get your volume of the muscle. And in this case, you can see that as we stretch the muscle, the volume increases. Um, and partly why that's happening, um, despite an assumption of the muscle um, being isovolumetric um, is because if you look at the OCT scan, um, the OCT, um, the, the light source can't actually penetrate <coughs> past the um, platinum hooks here. It's, this picture might be a little bit deceiving. You feel like you can see the whole thing, but actually you can't. If you were to rotate this around, you'll see a giant shadow um, behind the hook. So that's probably why there's, there's an increase of volume um, back there, despite the isovolumetric assumption. Um, so I published this data at, uh, well, I presented this paper at EMBC 2014 in Chicago, um, first first international conference visit. To, that was pretty cool, giant bean in Chicago. Um, yeah, so, and then also the full pager. So that was, uh, that was that bit. So this, this was probably near the start of my PhD, first, the second year, I think. And it's still been used um, to do a lot of good stuff um, lately. So um, Martin Nash's group has been using it to, to do some modeling work, and Prasad as well, um, Kenneth, um, to kind of build uh, computational models um, and using, using this to kind of build, uh, the, um, um, let's see, to, to to find the mechanical properties of the muscle. Um, and with Alex Anderson has used um, the OCT data to uh, complement his study in performing intracellular calcium measurement using this device. So um, seeing how the measurement is affected um, based on the size of the muscle 
at various sections. Um, did some work with a physiology a PhD student, a PhD student who used an enzyme to digest the muscle, and we basically monitored um, the digestion process, the, the change in the structure of the muscle throughout the whole process. And also some work with, um, that I didn't do, but um, Alex, um, Alex Anderson did with the OCT was to use it to image collagen scaffolds for the um, optometry department. Cool, so this sort of leads up to the next bit. Um, so everything I've shown you now has been imaging the 3D volume of the muscle while it's quiescent, um, while it's not contracting. The next bit is being able to image it while it is contracting. And I guess at first, um, it was, let's see, I guess I was playing around this idea of being able to capture the full 3D volume of the muscle while it's undergoing contraction. Now, with the OCT, it's fast enough to be able to um, capture a cross section um, while it's contracting, and kind of you can see how it changes. It's not fast enough to do, um, at, least, uh, at least with the OCT that we were using, it wasn't fast enough to be able to do complete 3D volume scans while the muscle's contracting. So how to solve for that? Well, now we've been able to synchronize in hardware the um, capture process with the stimulus. I figured maybe we can just uh, take um, images of uh, the cross sections, one cross section at a time and synchronize these, this image, um, this capture process with the stimulus that we provide the muscle. So that's what I did. Um, at the rising edge of every stimulus, I captured, I started a, um, I captured another cross section. And you can see we can kind of build um, contracting cross sections right along the entire muscle over several contractions. And doing this, you can then reconstruct it into a full 3D contracting volume, um, which you can see here. So I've done, um, this particular example is for two different lengths, muscle, and yeah, it's, uh, I thought it was pretty cool when I first saw this video. Um, and from, from this data, you can, you can extract how the volume changes um, during contraction, which then allows you to um, extract, you know, how the cross sections are changing uh, right along the muscle throughout the entire twitch. Um, so we won't go into too much detail in, in these graphs, but as you can, you can kind of see, you can quickly visualize um, points where there is a lot higher stress um, due to it being in the peak um, uh, part of contraction in um, systole. And um, over here you can see what's going on with the muscle when we shorten it, um, and the force is definitely a lot lower, and the stress is a lot lower as well. Cool. So that um, I first presented um, at the biophysics conference at uh, Baltimore like earlier in 2015, and then published it in the IEEE Transactions in, on Biomedical Engineering. So that was a that was probably a second international conference um, I went to, and that was an interesting one because it was it was during winter and and first of all travel was a little difficult. Um, when I was trying to get back, I kind of got snowed in, so I went went for a lab visit um, afterwards and stayed with a at a collaborator's um, um, house. And um, it started snowing very heavily. And this is Kentucky; it doesn't really snow that much. Um, it rarely snows that much there. Um, just happened to happened while I was there and my flights got cancelled and ended up being there for a few more days, but it's not too bad. Um, shoveled my way out in the end. So um, after I was able to capture these uh, contracting 3D volumes, I noticed another thing and it was that, let's see, if this muscle was truly fixed in length, you wouldn't expect um, any sort of in-plane motion, and it was completely uniform. But two things you can see here. First, it's not uniform for this particular specimen. It's got this big lump there. And if I play this video, you can see that there is some in-plane motion. So motion um, in the lengthwise direction of the trabecular. 
um, unfortunately, I mean, uh, one strategy would be to use this OCT data and um, do some cross correlation to kind of track the movement of um, of I guess these speckle points. But first of all, the speckle was actually quite random there, um, and also the features, internal feature, um, uh, sorry, structure of the trabecular is too small for the resolution of the OCT. So we resort to another strategy here, back to using the microscope, but for the purpose of finding the average movement in plane motion of the muscle. So you can see the OCT uh, mounted uh, again on the side, um, and here's the microscope that's uh, imaging an um, axis that's orthogonal to the OCT. And with the microscope image, you can see you can actually resolve the details of the muscle. You can if you can make out those stri vertical stripes there, those are the sarcomeres. Um, and those were the kind of the internal building blocks of the muscles, uh, muscle A. I don't think I mentioned yet, but I'll talk more about later. And you can capture, you can capture videos under the microscope of the muscle, and clearly you can see here that there is motion. So one problem is that the field of view um, of the microscope is, is quite limited and you've got a trade-off of your field of view and also in how much detail you can resolve. So thinking back on how I solved the problem for the OCT, um, I also applied a gated approach here with like, the microscope. So at every, at every rising edge of the stimulus that we provided, um, I captured one section at a time. Um, and we can't really move the microscope here, so we moved the muscle. We translated the muscle along, along the um, <coughs> uh, field of view. And doing this, you can collect a series of images while it's contracting. And because they've been all the capture, the image capture process has been synchronized with the um, stimulus, you can reconstruct <coughs> what's happening across the entire length of the muscle and still have the detail. Um, still retain detail. So that was very useful because that meant there's enough detail to do some um, feature tracking and we have the entire muscle. Cool. So um, what I used for, feature, um, for tracking the movement of the muscle was something called digital image correlation. And with this technique you split up your, your specimen, preferably split all over a random um, pattern. And then um, you track the movement of each of these individual, I guess, sub-images. And fortunately, there is enough sort of random, um, or almost random features on the muscle that we don't have to apply additional speckle pattern on. We can just use the natural features of the muscle. Um, and um, Amir, I don't know if he's here, he's, he was very helpful in that. He actually inspired me to, to try out this technique because I, um, he was, he's, for his PhD, he's been working very much on um, uh, implementation of DIC, a very good one, actually, and tried it out on some microscope images. Turns out it worked, out, uh, worked very, very well. So uh, we worked together there to, to apply this to uh, for trabecular. So I developed a sort of another image processing pipeline around that, um, taking these microscope images and then ending up with um, a series of dis um, uh, displacement vectors and velocity <coughs> vectors. So let me show you what that looks like. So here we've got the muscle. Um, I have patterned it with various material points here. Um, well, points on the material, embedded. Well, I basically overlaid a whole bunch of points that we're tracking. And if I just start this, as the muscle is contracting, you can see that those, uh, those material points we're tracking um, are being tracked extremely well. And we're able to figure out what the displacement of every material point is over the course of a contraction. So these units here are in pixels. Um, but 220 here translates to about 60 microns. So that's the kind of movement we are seeing. This is in the x direction. Um, 
along the length of the muscle, and this is in the Y, which is transverse to that. And not just the movement, but we can then from this derive the strain as well. Yeah. Um, so again, strain in the X direction, we can see that around this area, we see compression, even strain, and we have a bit of extension here at the ends of the muscle. Yeah, so, so now, we've, now we're able to track the, kind of, the movement of the material points right along the muscle, both with, well, with, with um, microscope imaging, and we're able to track the change in shape of the muscle using ICT. And now, I guess the task is to combine all of these measurements back into my own user and be able to make these measurements, preferably with <coughs> other measurements like heat as well. So a lot of things going on, we've got the OCT. Um, we've got thermopiles which are doing the heat measurements, um, force transducer, which are making the force measurements, and then the microscope, which I just mentioned. Um, so here's kind of what you get out of each measurement modality. And then we can combi start combining some of these measurements, um, volume and the heat rate to get the <coughs> average twitch heat, um, the volume and the, the force to find the stress of cross-sectional areas, um, and a few more other things as well. So ideally, we want this all in one system. Um, so the major, I guess the main challenge, I think, was integrating these, um, well, the OCT and the microscope with the heat measurement, because um, we are measuring the um, changes in, in temperature to a million foot of Kelvin. So this is extremely sensitive. Um, I walk past the instrument and then I see a massive swing in the signal and then I have to start again. So uh, eventually, you know, um, close the curtains around the instrument and remote desktop into my computer too. And did it after hours as well. <laughs> there was no one walking around the lab. Um, but just to kind of illustrate how the, the heat measurement uh, works, um, this was a pretty cool video that Callum, Callum generated. Here, here are two thermopiles. Here's the muscle mounted on the hooks. And then you've got solution flowing through this capillary. And because it's flowing, you get a gradient, a temperature gradient. And by measuring the differences in temperature across the two sides, you can estimate the heat rate of the muscle. So, you can see that in this image, I've jacketed up the whole um, whole uh, muscle bath with this foam, this aluminium foam stuff, which insulates it pretty well. And um, but of course, you know, you still have the OCT laser going into into the bath. You've also got the illumination from the microscope. And this graph here kind of illustrates this big drop here um, is me turning off the microscope illumination. So it's a massive signal compared to um, these little blips, which are um, caused by me turning on and off the muscle stimulator. So this is the heat rate of the muscle. This here is the microscope. But the fortunate thing is that um, the heat that the microscope produces is relatively stable. And it's several order, uh, orders of magnitude less than, um, less than the noise is several order of magnitudes less than the muscle heat. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to see the muscle heat at all in the signal. Um, so putting them together, um, I might be able to no start normalizing the heat based on the actual volume measured by the OCT. Um, you can see that this was the volume estimated by OCT, 4.2, 10 to the negative 11. Um, if we were to um, do the cylindrical approximation, it severely, in this case, underestimates the, the actual volume. So you would have had a um, much different, oh, here we go, the comparison of the heat rates that you would get using each of the methods, um, for e each of the, um, the estimations of volume, OCT or not OCT. Um, and this again was that muscle that I showed you before. So that heat data was this muscle with, did I put that video in? No, that twist right along the length of the muscle. 
Um, so just um, so with this work I presented uh, at um, previous MBC last year, <coughs> the conference that seems like a good bunch of the lab is at right now, <laughs> and it was it was pretty interesting. It was actually uh, held in um, Disney Contemporary Resort. Um, so that set up some good supervisor and student bonding time at Disney World. Uh, is Andrew here? Karen and uh, and James. Um, I don't know, doing some science on Buzz Lightyear, the Buzz Lightyear riot, I suppose. <laughs> and um, Andrew also insisted that we we go on. The, um, it's a small world ride as well. I just <laughs> Um, what was really interesting, we still still don't think we figured out how it worked in, um, to this day, was that as we were leaving the ride, somehow our names popped up. Um, Karen James uh, says goodbye, Karen James, then goodbye, Andrew. Um, no one else, just just the three of us. So still puzzled as how that happened. Uh, we didn't scan our band in or anything. Um, so next part is um, being able to combine um, the knowledge of how the tissue moves approximately and the OCT data to correct some, well, to be able to figure out stuff like um, what the change in cross-sectional area is along the twitch. Before it was difficult to do that because you, would, you couldn't be sure that um, the same cross-section, you're looking at the same cross-section in one, I guess, um, at one point across the entire twitch. And you can see here, um, this, this kind of video wasn't generated from the algorithm. I generate that in Adobe Premiere, but that kind of illustrates the point of tracking that cross section. And there is a movement there. Um, so, managed to combine the um, two data sets from the microscope and the OCT because both of them were captured for the same muscle. And on the top graph is along the x axis is time, and along the y axis is the position along the length of the muscle, and the color shows the cross section, average cross sectional area. At that point in the length. And um, you can see that at the ends of the muscle um, over here, um, if you don't take into account the motion of the muscle, you do get quite a big difference in terms of the estimation of change in cross-sectional area because what you're seeing there, that change, is not actually because the cross-sectional area changed, um, but because you've got a thicker piece of uh, muscle moving into that field of view. Um, another thing, another measurement that I was able to combine was sarcomere length. Um, this was more of an of a initial kind of comparison I did between the strain I estimated using a microscope technique and this measured sarcomere length also using a microscope, but using completely different methods. Um, so with a sarcomere, um, these are kind of the fundamental, I guess, units in the muscle, and you get a lot of these repeated along the myofibril, and the sarcomere length is the distance between the two z-discs. So you can capture that, I didn't actually show the process here, but um, the method I used for estimating the sarcomere length from the images was to take a 2D Fourier um, transform and find kind of the dominant frequency there to figure out what the average spacing is. So the top here is a strain that I estimated using um, the knowledge of the, well, um, after kind of tracking the material, the movement of the material points and deriving strain from that. The bottom is finding the change in sarcomere length based on those um, repeating features. Um, and if I play this video, cool. if I play this video, you can see that they're relatively matched, which is what we expect. I didn't put on loop. There is a, definitely a lot more noise with the sarcomere link measurement and um, it's inherent to the process that I was using. But overall, um, they agree with each other, which is a good thing because we expect that as the sarcomere length shortens, your local strain will also, there will also be some local negative strain. Um, and here's just kind of a comparison there. Again, the sarcomere link measurement was a lot more noisy. Cool, so um, just wrapping this up, um, the kind of main contributions um, from my PhD project was being able to demonstrate that, yes, we can, um, not just image uh, muscle 
uh, trip party and trabecular using OCT, but be able to do this while it's being stimulated um, and while we're performing um, other measurements as well. And um, I've been able to develop uh, a method um, to be able to capture the, the volume of the muscle, the change in volume of the muscle during the course of a contraction using um, the gated approach, which I described earlier. Um, using a microscope to get this complete strain field and displacement field. Um, then using that data to correct um, full emotion of tissue when we are <coughs> estimating stuff like uh, change in cross-sectional area. And um, show that yes we can actually normalize, we can do a lot better as well, normalize um, heat to the volume of the muscle captured by the OCT. And those are just some of the the outputs from this project. Yeah, was the was the four years worth it? I think so. <laughs> um, definitely learned a lot um, throughout my PhD. Um, not just the you know, technical side of it, but um, also um, a lot around you know, things like time management. Um, throughout my PhD, well, part way through my PhD, decided to um, work on a company as well with Richard and Daniel, and um, that definitely you know, managing the two two sides, the research and the commercial side was uh, definitely a good good experience, and a lot of uh, transferable skills like making coffee and working <laughs> in the industry. Um, so, so the, the company that um, I mentioned um, just briefly before, um, so Daniel, who was a uh, um, colleague in Megatronics and also did a PhD in here in bioengineering and uh, Richard in the crowd. Um, after the Microsoft Imagine Cup competition we decided to start a, a software company and our first product there was uh, something called UV Lens and the idea of this app was to keep you safe in the sun. Nothing to do with my PhD project but still like to think that it's got a bit of uh, uh, bioengineering in it. <laughs> um, so. Another thing that, um, that we explored last year was uh, chatbots. And these are kind of little, little um, I guess, I'd like to think of them as computer programs that sit um, in your messenger interface, which is getting popular in some countries, um, and especially in Asia. This particular chatbot here um, got us a little piece in um, Wired Magazine, which was nice. Basically, well, it's called What the F is That? You take a photo of something and it tells you what it is. Um, so that was a, a neat little, neat little um, thing that we built, and it got us into the whole realm of chatbots. So um, transitioned um, pretty much full time into into the company now, and it's been a great couple of months, and uh, working in it. Um, so throughout this whole journey, um, for my PhD, it wouldn't be possible if it, if it wasn't for my wonderful supervisors, um, Andrew and Paul, both of which um, aren't here at the moment. I think they're both at the conference, at the EMBC conference. Um, both very knowledgeable, and I think it's not just um, not just the technical guidance, but also you know, support through, especially since I had um, the company going on at the same time as well, my supervisors were uh, very supportive around that, um, without, around working on a startup while doing my PhD. So um, they have my gratitude. Um, Alex and um, Callum, who I work with, um, first part portion of my PhD, they were also on the Malmutter project. And I think if it wasn't for their um, very, very robust engineering on the, on the cardiac Malmutter, um, I wouldn't have been able to finish my PhD especially if something say broke halfway. <laughs> so um, great job on those guys. Um, Brian, who's, who's been amazing in terms of providing um, technical advice and almost everything. He knows a lot about everything pretty much, <laughs> especially around mechanical um, design and electronics. Um, Frederic, who helped me at the start of the project in terms of um, the OCT and the optical side of things. Never did any op optics and mechatronics, but um, did a lot in the first year of my PhD. Um, Dennis, um, awesome guidance and the sort of physiology side of things, especially a you know, mechatronics engineer like me who um, lasted biology in uh, year 13, that was very helpful. 
Um, JC, who's helped uh, me dissect a lot of the muscles and with his uh, awesome dissection skills, allowed me to capture a lot of that data. Tone as well. Um, I think Tone helped me capture the last piece of my, um, last set of um, results that I needed to finish my PhD. And I think you stayed um, in a bit late that day as well, so yeah, thanks a lot for that. And Mari as well, who's also contributed a lot in the physiological discussions in our, in our meetings. Um, rest of the ABI staff, especially Peter, who's been very generous and, um, and um, kind and um, giving us um, some space to work on our um, startup in, in the ABI so, so we could kind of, kind of switch between the two projects relatively quickly without the travel. Um, so we're very thankful for that. And the admin team, who, uh, who's got my, who gets my flight sorted and uh, gets my packages delivered on <laughs> time. Um, technical staff, uh, Steve and Steve and Greg, um, who's definitely helped a lot in terms of um, helping me manufacture a lot of the stuff, um, electrical and mechanical components, and IT team, of course. Um, for making sure I don't get uh, the WannaCry malware on my computer <laughs> and encrypt my entire hard drive. <coughs> um, Daniel and Richard, who have been, I guess, have been working with for the last, is it like three years now, um, on the company. And they've also been very understanding on that si on their side, especially when I had my thesis that I needed to finish and had to step out of the company for a little bit during that time. And um, yeah, the rest of the um, rest of the lab. Um, Andrew always sets up awesome uh, Christmas parties. This was one of them. Yeah, and yeah, thanks to all of you who have come today to listen to my talk. I couldn't decide on the, the color of my thesis, so I printed all three colors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks very much, Ming. It's a really fascinating uh, videos and a really fascinating work. So thanks cool. very Thank much you. for that. And congratulations on that. Thanks. So on that note, so uh, where are you with your thesis now? Has it been examined? Are you? Yeah. So it's um, examined, and I've um, submitted the final copy. Ah, so that's all okay. for now. I'm glad that's uh, on my shoulders. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Wonderful. So we do have some time for questions. So open up the floor for questions. Why don't I start? <laughs> in, in the old days, using wire wound flatbed uh, thermopiles uh, and much bigger muscles, mm -hmm. it was possible by halting the winding or to by in, by interrupting the winding at various places to get estimates of the amount of heat along different portions of the muscle. Mm -hmm. Now that was something that's ten times longer than you've been working with or more. But si since you seem not to have the foggiest notion of what's too hard <laughs> to achieve, is there any chance of ever doing that with a trabecule? It, in that, in that flow-through rig? Hmm. In the flow-through rig, um, I mean, I've got, there's definitely a, a trade-off with the firma piles. Um, um, there's a, a, there's a trade-off with you know, size of the firma tapal and also the sensitivity. So uh, probably repeating, putting more firma piles in might might not be the solution. Although you might be able to, say, add some more and shift it slightly, shift the second set. Um, how they say, um, maybe the opposite side or kind of uh, transverse, not transverse, orthogonal to this set of the piles. Um, I can't say I thought um, very much into the heat measurement side of, um, I guess, the engineering around the heat measurement side of things, um, but. I suppose if in a day we can get a sensitive enough kind of full field infrared, um, I guess, imaging camera that's sensitive enough to this kind of heat, which is, I don't think it's possible right now, maybe in the future, then there could be a possibility of getting the full kind of a um, map of what the heat distribution is along the length of the muscle. Thank you. It might be a silly question, but. Um the OCT that you've developed, that system, mm -hmm. how translatable is it to other muscles? 
to other muscles. Um, or is it specific for the particular? It's actually, it can be used for quite a wide, a wide range of biological tissues, and even beyond muscles as well. Okay. Really the limiting factor is the dimension of the muscle. So with trabecular, um, it's, I guess the dimensions are quite convenient in the sense that um, all of, uh, we're able to image the entire muscle um, um, and all of that is within kind of the imaging depth of OCT, which is around a millimeter or two. If you get thicker samples, then you get, there's a bit more scattering, you get a lot more losses as you go uh, further down. Um, but I think as long as it's within the right dimensions and it has enough scattering components, if it's completely transparent, then again, it's, uh, you might be able to only measure the kind of the outline of it. Um, you can use it for other types as well. Precisely. Um, just wondering, is that muscle see through the muscle you were working Because when you're looking at the tracking results, it's seen that um, you could see more than just the top surface. Yeah, so it's definitely translucent, and it does kind of depend on um, where, I guess, your, your focal plane, where, where that's set, um, yeah. what part you're seeing. Um, and also, I mean, um, fortunately, I guess this muscle, there was not too much. <coughs> movement in the vertical in and out of the plane of the microscope but otherwise if there was then you might you know see um potentially other planes of the microscope as well ah so you can focus at a specific plane and you want Rel relatively not ah. um it's not to a level of, say something like confocal where you're right, just looking at a particular layer but yeah ah, so you are actually then looking at a specific um Plane, yeah, yeah rather than just the surface. So your tracking is going not going to be so influenced by what's happening at the different um, you know, layers of our layers Yeah, well, I mean, it's yeah. Again, it, it does depend on which layer we're looking at. So yeah. right now, it's um, in terms of motion that we estimate, it is the average. I'm uh, assuming an um, average write down. I guess the um, I see direction of the the microscope, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, but. Um, what you can do is you can focus it at different points, ah, get a displacement field of those different planes, and then sort of average that out, or get an idea of how it shifts. So, just wondering, because this is in a bar, isn't it? Pardon? It, this is the muscles in a bar, yeah, so yeah, it's it immersed in, in, in something. So um, I just, just wonder, do you think it's possible to add some sort of markers to the surface that you can, uh, like, um, I don't know if this is possible, fluorescent markers or something mm -hmm. like that, where at least you know that there are points on the surface, for instance, mm -hmm. that can be tracked. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or is um, it difficult to uh, attach? So yeah, I mean, yeah, you definitely can add some markers. I guess the, um, I guess one of the, the reasons I, I went with this method um, in the first place was the ability to do it without any markers. But if you did put in markers, of course, you can still work with that, work with that, um, I guess, um, work of tracking the location of those markers. As they move. Yeah. Dan? And how much smaller can you make the OCT system and will that allow you to use it in applications outside of the medical space? Um, people have actually been able to do sort of endoscopic OCT um, um, systems. I mean, the optics that drive this thing still are maybe the size of a box, but the probe, instead of having a what you saw there being about uh, you know, 10 centimeters wide. Uh, they've had, you can create a little handheld probe, which is maybe you know, a couple of millimeters, just a fiber, uh, which you can kind of scan across a specimen. Any other questions? All right, let's thank me for a very entertaining Please join us.